Mr. Speaker. Order, questions for oral answers. Ms. Cheryl Chan. Question one, please. Mr. Speaker, may I have your permission to take a question one and two in yes, my uh, administrative statement? Yes, please. Ms. Polisan. Speaker, may I have your permission to answer questions three and four together? Yes, please. Thank you, sir. Sir, more people have taken up cycling since the pandemic started. This is a good development as cycling is a convenient, environmentally friendly and healthy way to travel. The key is to ensure safety, safety for different groups of road users. Where possible, we will separate bicycles from motor vehicles by providing cycling paths. We are building more cycling paths within and between towns, from about 460 kilometers today to more than 1,300 kilometers by 2030. However, it is not always possible to have separate paths for motor vehicles and bicycles. There will be many instances and locations where motorists and cyclists have to share the same road space. To enhance road safety, it is important to have clear rules for motorists and cyclists and for everyone to follow these safety rules. For on-road cyclists, there are existing rules under the Road Traffic Act which they must follow. For example, cyclists must comply with all traffic rules, such as adhering to traffic light signals and avoiding the use of expressways and tunnels. They should also ride as near as possible to the far left edge of the road. This means they should keep to the left of the leftmost lane, unless they are turning right or making a U-turn. On single lane roads, Cyclists are required to ride in a single file so they do not obstruct passing vehicles. The majority of cyclists follow the safety rules, but there is a minority of errant cyclists who use their mobile phones while riding, refuse to stop at red lights, ride in the middle lane of a major road, including expressways where bicycles are prohibited, and some of them react aggressively when they are called out for their actions. We will enforce against such behaviours. Errant cyclists can face up to $1,000 fine and a six-month jail, jail term for the first offence with higher penalties for repeat offenders. There are also motorists who drive recklessly and endanger the lives of others, including cyclists, and we will take enforcement actions against them too. We should bear in mind that cyclists are more vulnerable than those travelling in motor vehicles. The Active Mobility Advisory Panel, or AMAP, will review ways to raise awareness amongst motorists on how to share road space safely with cyclists and other users. Ultimately, there needs to be more graciousness, consideration 
as well as give and take on the roads. Other countries have done it, and I believe so can we. Beyond enforcement, the more enduring solution is public education. In his written PQ, Mr. Dennis Tan asks if we have a public education campaign on safe practices for cyclists and pedestrians. Since 2018, LTA has offered the Safe Riding Program. This is a voluntary education program that is free of charge, with both theory and practical components for all active mobility device users, including cyclists. LTA is revamping the Safe Riding Program and will work with traffic police to reach out to road users and encourage public participation. We intend to roll out the new Safe Riding Program in the next few months. AMAP is also reviewing if our safety rules need to be strengthened and whether existing penalties need to be increased. For example, it is studying suggestions from the public on whether cyclists should be required to ride in a single file at all times on the road, and if there should be limits on group sizes for on-road cycling. On whether to license on-road cyclists, there are mixed views from the public. Some are in support of licensing so that errant cyclists can be more easily identified and punished. Others have expressed concerns that licensing on-road cyclists will increase compliance costs and affect the livelihoods of Singaporeans who are using their bicycles for work and for commute. AMAP will adopt a fair and balanced approach in doing its review by consulting widely and hearing from different groups of stakeholders. Most jurisdictions, like the Netherlands and Denmark, do not license cyclists. Vienna licenses children aged 10 to 12 years old who ride alone on roads to ensure they are educated with road traffic rules. But adult cyclists are not required to have a license. Tokyo? Tokyo requires bicycles to be registered, but the purpose is to deter bicycle theft and not to enhance road safety. Beijing used to register bicycles too, but decided to abolish the scheme in 2004 as they found it to be costly and ineffective. AMAP will review the practices in overseas jurisdictions and study the different options and trade-offs carefully before finalising its recommendations. Sir, road safety is a collective effort by the community requiring each of us, all of us, to play a part. Beyond reviewing the safety rules and penalties, I would like to urge all road users to drive and ride safely. Be considerate to one another, and in doing so, make our roads safer for everyone. Thank you. Ms. Polisan. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, SMS. Good to know that MOT does not intend to license cyclists. I have one uh, SQ on enhancing safe cycling in Singapore. While PCN and cycling paths across the whole of Singapore will take time to build, can LTA embark on selective improvements to infrastructure that can enhance safety? For instance, widening of existing shared paths that are already too narrow, and also adding more signage and markings on roadways, especially in road stretches with typically higher cyclist traffic and also junctions with blind spots. Thank you. So I thank Ms. Poe for her supplementary questions. Uh, first, to clarify, AMAP is currently still doing its review, so it has not come to any landing point uh, at this moment. Uh, it is studying carefully the different options and trade-offs uh, but what I shared earlier in my main reply was to highlight some of the practices in overseas jurisdictions where they do not license cyclists or bicycles, but they have other ways 
of improving road safety. So I think we do need to look at these carefully because I think uh, what I, I believe uh, where Ms. Poe is coming from and where some of the members of public are coming from is that licensing may seem like an attractive idea to improve road safety, but in practice and based on the experiences in other countries, whether that is indeed an effective way or are there other more effective ways? I think that's something that AMAP is carefully studying. So I agree with Ms. Poe that while we look at how to enhance, I'm sorry, to expand, how we look at how to expand our cycling paths, our park connectors, uh, in the meantime, there are also other ways to improve the infrastructure, to improve road safety in our towns uh, for all users. So just to give an example, uh, in Topayo, where I'm looking after the town, uh, we are working together with LTA and also the other agencies, PUB, uh, to cover up some of the open drains and convert them into wider footpaths. And in doing so, as Ms. Poe pointed out, there will be more space for different groups of road users, pedestrians, cyclists. But this is an important effort that must be complemented by users putting safety as a priority. So the footpaths may be wider, but you must still ride safely and you must still look out for bicycles and other devices, other pedestrians, when you are walking along these footpaths. So at the end of the day, I think what's most important is a combination of good infrastructure, but also, I think, safety consciousness, placing priority on safety for all users. Thank you, sir. Professor Rizal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, SMS, for, for that, uh, for that uh, sharing of the uh, importance of uh, cycling. And I'm most particularly interested was in the public education. I totally agree with this uh, importance of uh, public education. So would uh, the ministry consider conducting these uh, lessons in schools? Because I think it's, that's one of the early touch points that we can actually educate our children. Uh, but most importantly, I see that in that context, uh, would the ministry consider working closely with MOE to inculcate this curriculum, put it in the curriculum, so that our students are given a better idea of safety and road safety in the future. Thank you. Uh, so I... I I'm unable to answer on behalf of MOE on this point, but I just wanted to highlight uh, that currently, primary school students do go through uh, uh, activities to teach them about road safety. There's also a collaboration with Traffic Police and LTA uh, to bring our students to the road safety park and to uh, expose them to different aspects of uh, uh, road safety. Uh, and I think this is something which requires continuous reinforcement along the way. Um, I'm not sure whether we want to put it into the curriculum because the curriculum is already, I think, very heavy with different uh, content. Uh, but this is something which I think we can find other ways of raising awareness, not just with students, but also with other groups of road users. And I mentioned earlier the Safe Riding Program LTA is working on this with traffic police, and I hope that when the revised program is ready, uh, we can encourage the public to participate in this. Thank you. Second tempo. Thanks, uh, SMS, for the reply to my questions. I wanted to find out whether is it possible to uh, for the deployments of uh, you know the Cisco. Uh, or IC police to actually help educate uh, cyclists at this moment and also motorists at this moment while we are planning for the review and planning for the improvement to the infrastructure. Because as I noticed that like, uh, in certain uh, area where cyclists uh, like to actually uh, go to, uh, they normally uh, cycle in the group and occupy the entire left lane actually is causing uh, danger to themselves and also to others uh, 
uh, motorists on the road, uh, often that I find uh, their argument as to who had the right to the lane. So uh, while I think I agree with all my colleagues earlier on, I think education is key. I think whether pending all the review, is it possible for LTA to look at this education for the time being, right, to enforce a message to make sure all cycling actually keep in one single row. Please keep not, the preamble yeah, short, please. Yeah, thank you. Just to keep yourself to a single row to the extreme left lane. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, so I agree with uh, Mr. Gan that education and enforcement need to go hand in hand. That's what we have been doing. Uh, Mr. Gan may be aware that we have uh, been enforcing uh, adherence to safety rules, and this is a joint effort by Traffic Police and LTA. Uh, but we do need to recognise as well that um, when cyclists are on the roads, uh, they are more vulnerable compared to those who are travelling in motor vehicles. So I also urge drivers to bear that in mind. Uh, if you are driving past cyclists, uh, please remember that they are more vulnerable on the roads. And I think it's important also to uh, remember that the current rule on a multi-lane road, it is not against the rule for cyclists to ride in the leftmost lane, but riding two abreast. They need not be in a single file. This is the current rule. They are only required to ride in a single file if they are riding on a road with a single lane. And that is mainly to prevent obstruction to traffic. But on the multi-lane road, and they are riding on the leftmost lane, they are currently allowed to ride two abreast. And there are some ongoing discussions with uh, different groups of stakeholders on whether this is a good practice or not. Uh, from one perspective, it does help to enhance safety for the cyclists, because when they are riding in a group, uh, and I think some cyclists also agree that the group should not be too big, but they say if they are riding in a reasonably sized group and the cars that are driving past uh, treat this group like as though they are one slow-moving vehicle, and then you pay more attention to looking out for them, being more aware of their presence on the road. Uh, so there are some valid reasons as well why this rule is currently crafted. But as I said earlier, AMAP is reviewing we are looking at the trade-offs, and I think uh, they will consult widely with different groups of stakeholders before coming to the final recommendation.